everybody. Welcome back. Uh, here's another lesson, um, remote learning. Woohoo, it's May. You got about five more weeks. So um, let's keep it moving. So you've been learning about molecules recently and covalent compounds. Um, and one thing you want to keep in mind with the lesson today, um, over here, these, this is an ionic compound, sodium chloride, where the red is sodium and the green is chlorine. Okay. With ionic substances, um, there is no one distinct combination of atoms that stands alone from the rest. For instance, this pair here of red and green atoms, okay, um, certainly they pair up, but this red could also pair up with this sodium atom or with this sodium atom. Okay, so there's no distinct NaCl that stands alone as its own thing. With molecules, it's different. This is one or over here, and each one or molecule stands alone as its own distinct thing, separate from other molecules of water. Each one or molecule is its own thing. Okay, now because molecules are like that, um, they have certain properties and they interact and behave in certain ways, okay? Uh, and one of those things has to do with polarity in the intermolecular forces between molecules, okay? Uh, you know, intermolecular referring to the forces between two different molecules, okay? So we start with what are called dispersion forces, okay? This is how nonpolar molecules are attracted to each other. This is a much weaker force of attraction, okay? It's between molecules without a permanent dipole. What is that? I'll tell you in a minute, okay? As I said a second ago, dispersion forces are a weak attraction between molecules that are nonpolar. So last week in one of the lessons, I mentioned that nonpolar mixes with other nonpolar because there are dispersion forces attracting those molecules, okay? These are also called London forces, okay? Um, a dipole is when you have two atoms with a big enough difference in electronegativity, the attraction for the electrons that one atom is sharing with another, okay? So when you have a large enough difference in electronegativity, um, what happens is that the bond is polar one of the atoms becomes positive and the other is negative. And the reason that happens, the negative atom with a higher electronegativity ends up hogging the electrons. It's like, I want them, I'm getting them, you know. Um, so it ends up being more negative most of the time because it's hogging electrons. The other atom then is left with electrons less of the time and it has a positive charge most of the time. Uh, a molecule, large molecules, can have several dipoles. A dipole refers to one bond between two atoms. And if it's polar, we call it a dipole, okay? Molecules with dipoles are attracted to one another. There's a thing called dipole attraction, which happens between substances that are weak, polar. Not very polar, but they are polar, okay? That's dipole attraction. Now, one other thing here, hydrogen bonding, which we usually teach you about in biology because it's relevant in living things. This is a much stronger attraction between substances that are very polar. For instance, water sticks to itself, forms droplets, has very high cohesion, etc., because of hydrogen bonding. Okay. Okay. Now, this was also part of one of your lessons last week. For a for a single bond, or for a bond rather, between two atoms, how do you know its polarity? You have to look at the difference in electronegativity. Remember, anywhere from zero to 0 0.4 difference is nonpolar. 0.5 to 1.7 is a polar bond. And anything above 1.7 is ionic. It's not even a molecule. Okay. So that tells you if a specific bond is polar. Now, the other thing that determines if a molecule is polar 
or not. Hold on. Okay. So polarity and the difference in electronegativity will also, you know, will tell you if a molecule is polar or not. The other thing you have to consider is symmetry, the arrangement, the shape of the molecule. And this is where Vesper theory comes into play. Okay. So you have to determine the shape of the molecule. Okay. And here's what happens. If you have dipoles, if you have polar bonds with that electronegativity difference between 0.5 and 1.7, if the dipoles are directly opposite one another at a 180 degree angle, they end up canceling out, balancing out, and the molecule then behaves in a nonpolar way, even if it has polar bonds in it. Okay? So that's one thing that happens. So the symmetry of the molecule, if this is true, if polar bonds are directly opposite of each other, the molecule is nonpolar. However, if there are polar bonds and they are not at a 180 degree angle, if they're not directly opposite of each other, then the molecule will behave in a polar way. Okay. Let's work through some examples, or let me show you something first here. So on the left, we have water, and on the right, we have carbon dioxide, CO2. Both molecules contain polar bonds. The O to H bond is polar. This is carbon. The red ones here are oxygen. The, the CO bond is also polar. However, if you notice, in carbon dioxide, this bond and this bond are at a 180 degree angle to each other. They're directly opposite, okay? So with water, that's not the case because water has a bent shape. Its angle here is 104 degrees, roughly, okay? So the dipoles in water are not at a 180. Because of that, water is polar. Carbon dioxide, even though it contains polar bonds, those bonds, as I said a moment ago, are at a 180 degree angle. They're directly opposite of each other. So CO2 is not polar, okay? Yeah, if polar bonds are arranged in a way where they cancel out due to the symmetry, the shape of the molecule, the molecule is gonna be nonpolar, okay? So let's look at some examples. Carbon disulfide is the next one. Here's our compound CS4. Take a moment here and see if you can determine the shape of this molecule. <clears throat> okay, there's our Lewis dot structure, two double bonds there. With an X formula of AX2, it is a linear shape. So if we do a 3D drawing, it would be something like this, just a straight line, okay? Um, next, what is the electronegativity difference between carbon and sulfur? Take a minute and determine that. So the difference is zero. They have the same electronegativity. So what kind of bond is it? It's a nonpolar bond. Okay. So this molecule, CS4, um, I'm sorry, CS2, I'm going to fix that. Um, it only has nonpolar bonds. Therefore, this molecule is nonpolar. Here's a question. Would this compound mix with water? Water is polar, as you know. Answer that now. <clears throat> no, this would not mix with water. Water's polar. Carbon disulfide is nonpolar. Here's another one. Sulfur difluoride. Okay. Take a moment and see if you can determine the shape of sulfur difluoride. Okay. Here's your Lewis dot structure. You'll notice there there are two lone pairs on the sulfur. So AX2E2, it has a bent shape, much like water. Here's a drawing. Okay. Now if you notice there, I've added a positive um, charge and two negative charges. Okay. Um, take a moment 
and determine is sulfur is the sulfur fluorine bond s to f polar or nonpolar <clears throat> so the electronegativity difference is 1.5 the bond is polar okay because fluorine has a higher electronegativity it ends up being negative most of the time both fluorines and the sulfur is left with a positive charge most of the time. Each S to F we refer to as a dipole. Okay, So we have polar bonds. Are they at a 180 degree angle? No. So this molecule is polar. Okay. One more question. Would this mix with water? <clears throat> this would mix with water, both water and sulfur difluoride are polar. Okay. All right, a few more here. Carbon dioxide, we've already looked at a few moments ago. There's your Lewis dot structure, okay, with two double bonds there, linear shape, and here are the dipoles added. Carbon ends up being positive, and the oxygens are negative. The electronegativity difference is one between C and O, and it's a polar bond, okay. But again, the shape is a straight line. So this O to C and this oxygen to carbon bond, they're directly opposite each other. So the polarity, it's nonpolar. Okay, this is a case where the polar bonds balance each other out, cancel each other out, and the molecule is nonpolar. Okay. Here's another one, methylene chloride. There's your formula. Take a moment and determine the shape. By the way, carbon goes in the middle, hydrogens and chlorines go around the carbon. There's your Lewis dot structure. X formula AX4. So the shape is tetrahedral. Okay. Again, think of it like a tripod with one atom sticking up out of the tripod. Okay. Now for the bonds, determine whether they are polar or nonpolar. So your electronegativity differences, C to H, 0.4, C to Cl, 0.5. So bond polarity, carbon-hydrogen bond is nonpolar, carbon to chlorine bond is polar. So here's another question. This molecule, methylene chloride, is it polar or not? Answer that. <clears throat> so as it turns out, the molecule is polar. Okay, It's weak, but it is polar. Okay, We have two polar bonds here and here. Carbon ends up being positive, and the chlorines are negative. So that region of the molecule would act in a polar way. So this molecule would be considered polar for that reason, and it would mix with other polar substances. Okay. That one's a little tricky, so if you worked through it, awesome. There you go. Thumbs up. Good job, everybody. Um, oh, and that's all. Okay. So again, when we want to know if a molecule is polar, or nonpolar, we look at that electronegativity difference for each individual bond. We also have to look at the overall shape of the molecule. Both things determine if a molecule is polar or if it's nonpolar. Okay, everybody. Uh, in the next lesson, you'll have a bit of um, a video lab to work through. So, um, also a copy of this PowerPoint will be in classroom along with this video. All right, everybody. Um, I'll see you next time.